Uh, so hello everyone and welcome to the Public Knowledge Project Annual General Meeting. I am Alan Bell, the Chair of the Advisory Committee, and I'm happy to see so many people attending the meeting as the community is what drives PKP. One of the strengths of PKP is that it is distributed team. For many years they have worked remotely from wherever in the world they happen to be. So while PKP's day-to-day -day operations and development were not adversely impacted by the shift to working from home due to the pandemic, we all have been affected by the lack of face-to-face -face interaction with the community, all of you. PKP depends on the vibrant, passionate international community whose contributions and engagement help to make our software better. Your voices and contributions are everything to us. Uh, and we endeavor to find ways to actively support, educate, and engage the community. Many of us were fortunate to be able to get together in Barcelona, and we are hoping that we can start face-to-face -face interactions sometime in 2021. As the provincial health officer in British Columbia, Dr. Bonnie Henry has said, this is not forever, it is for now. She has also told us to be kind, be calm and be safe, which is my wish for all of you and your families in our PKP community. Shifting to the business of the AGM, I wanted to introduce today's presenters. Kevin Stranack, the PKP Managing Director, will give us the year in review. The inimitable John Malinsky, the PKP Director, will talk about what being open means to PKP. Then the Communications Coordinator, Marissa McDonald, will introduce the new proposal for the PKP Membership Program. Next, Alex Mecker, the Associate Director of Development, and Nate Wright, the Platform Experience Lead, will give us the OJS Public Roadmap launch. Uh, with that, I think it's time to turn things over to Kevin for the year in review. So what I wanted to do just uh, in my uh, bit of time today was just draw your attention to the annual report. Uh, we would have had a, a screenshot out, but we won't do that. But you can see on the PKP website, um, pkp.sfu.ca, uh, there's a blog post with the annual report. And you can see the link there. So I do ask you to, when you do have a chance, take a look at that. Um, You'll be happy to know I'm not going to go through it page by page, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to just pull out some of the highlights from the past year and uh, really wanted to, to acknowledge all of the contributions that so many people and so many institutions have made to PKP. Um, you know, and that includes so many who volunteered their time to do translations, to contribute their code, to provide time for usability testing, to write documentation, uh, to help others on the forum, to serve on our committees and our interest groups and participated at our community events. And of course, to our home base at the SFU library that provides so much to us as well. And in addition to those kinds of in-kind contributions, the financial um, contributors have been amazing for us as well to allow us to do our work. Um, this includes the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, which has provided us with deep and ongoing support, along with our coalition public partner, ARD, at the University of Montreal. And we really appreciate the support we've gotten from our development partners and our sustainers. And many of, of you have been with us since we initiated our sustainability strategy more than eight years ago. Um, and it's, it's just, it means so much to us that you continue to support us. And we also welcome our newest supporters who have joined um, even just in the last year. Um, we're super grateful for the recognition from SCOS uh, that we received last year, recognizing PKP as a key provider of open infrastructure. And although the pandemic has slowed down the progress of, uh, of our SCOS um, involvement, we really have to thank the institutions that have stepped up so far to support us. And we're, we continue to be optimistic that um, that project will continue to grow once everyone has a better sense of their finances over the next coming months. So speaking of finances, um, Quickly, just to review the financial report. If you do take a look at the link, you'll be able to see it. Um, just the revenues page, you'll see that um, publishing services revenues have gone up significantly. And we're very pleased to see that. And this growth took place even before we were able to implement some of the planned uh, sales and marketing activities that um, SCOS will be funding us to do. Uh, grant revenues down a little bit, but that's not a surprise. Grants go up and down, and part of building up publishing services was to reduce our dependence on that ebb and flow of grants. Uh, what looks like a significant increase in development partner and sustainers is actually a little bit misleading because we had one development partner, um, they're in the timing of the invoices um, came in, so they paid actually twice um, in that year, so there was less uh, the previous year. 
So when you correct for that, it's pretty much stable um, since last year. Um, we're very much hoping that that's going to stay stable again this year, looking forward despite the pandemic. And we know the resulting institutional budget challenges that everybody's facing. And the last uh, line there in the revenue are just the in-kind contributions from SFU. And there was uh, more there as well um, in the 2019 year, which we're very grateful for. The library really stepped up with some additional support around um, reviewing our accounting procedures, um, PKP, um, preservation network development, some um, help with server migrations and maintenance, lots of work there. So we really appreciate our home base at SFU. And if you look on the expenses page, um, taking a look at that, um, you'll see the administration line is down quite a bit. And this is more due to some reclassification, moving some things out of that category into infrastructure as we did a bit of a review of how we were categorizing some things, but overall stable. Um, infrastructure though did go up quite a bit. Um, we've increased our work with our third party server provider. And this is in response to the increase of publishing services business. Um, we've had to um, um, pay for more server space um, and working with that company. Uh, the increase in the community support and outreach was the result of a lot of staff travel in 2019. Remember that? <laughs> we uh, attended other conferences from our, from our other friends and um, allied organizations. Uh, we had three sprints. Um, in 2019. We had Vancouver, Pittsburgh, and Barcelona. And of course, 2019 was a PKP conference here. Um, so we had our 2019 conference in Barcelona. This number is going to be a lot lower in 2020, unfortunately. Um, and finally, our personnel costs were up. Um, we did some hiring to respond to uh, just the increase in publishing services activities to achieve our grant objectives and to uh, invest in many improvements to the software. But overall, we came out um, with a nicely balanced budget. So to wrap up uh, my brief section here, I just wanted to, to also just express my thanks to the PKP staff who make all of this work possible. And although most of us were already working from home, um, they really um, continued to endure the stresses of the pandemic with, with a lot of grace and good humor and an ongoing commitment to the excellent, to, to doing excellent work and really with a, a strong spirit of openness and collaboration with our community. And they are an amazing group of people um, to work with. And so I just wanted to thank them. And uh, that's it for my section, Alan. I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, we'll turn it over to John now. John? Okay, well, thanks so much. Uh, let me start. I'm going to talk a bit about openness, um, which we've seen one kind of display of. Um, but before that, I want to thank Kevin. Um, this is Kevin's final AGM as Managing Director. Um, and we have grown, uh, been inspired by his leadership. We have flourished uh, under um, his involvement as Managing Director. So if I could ask you all, let me see if I can find it here. Um, to a, a round of applause um, as, as best we can in this day and age. Maybe we can uh, ask the hackers to, no. Um, but uh, Kevin, it's been tremendous. And uh, although you're not stepping down right now, um, this is the, the final AGM and it's been uh, terrific under your leadership the, this year. Um, and uh, we owe you for that. But let me turn to my topic very briefly. Um, Marissa McDonald, uh, to her credit as our communications uh, officer, um, gave us a theme um, and provided a narrative structure for this AGM. Um, and the openness element is the perfect one uh, in this time when we're closed in, as it were, uh, sheltering in place on the one hand. And on the other, we're seeing uh, the effects of open science, um, the race to uh, the vaccine, the uh, spread of preprints, all of these things are elements of, of open. But let me just note, uh, as I tend to do in terms of the history of things, that we began before open. Um, that's how far back we go. That's how old I am. Um, and we started in 1998 as PKP, uh, and there was no open source software. It was free software. Um, there was no open access. Um, there was free to read. Even then, there wasn't a kind of decision about that. I loved free to read, by the way, and rolls off the tongue so nicely. Um, but by the time we released our software, 
Um, so we started in 1998, and we did have a little bit of a debate and an inquiry, and it turns out 2002 is my revised starting date for OJS instead of 2001. Um, May is my uh, candidate month. Uh, in 2002, when we released OJS for the first time, uh, it was open source software. Um, there had been an agreement that free software was an interesting concept, but really open source software was um, the preferred term, at least by some. Uh, and we certainly got behind it. So just to give you a sense of uh, what that brought, what that meant, um, I can now say very confidently that PKP uses open source software to build open infrastructure in support of open access scholarly publishing and preprints, which is a key component of open science. Um, and those are all good words, but we actually treat openly uh, or the openness aspect uh, more thoroughly than that. It's not good enough just to throw the words on the screen. Um, the components for us about being open um, is when we think about it, and our project has been largely focused on this, is helping others to open doors and open minds in publishing um, where they have not previously had the chance. So we see it as a responsibility, not simply to open the door and let people come in, as it turns out in this case, um, but we see it as something that we need to support. We need to provide structure. We need to get into the elements of instruction. So our approach has been, right from the beginning, is that we provide contextual help. And a good example of that is the ISSN. I remember when we first introduced that into our journals, we provided links to the United Nations and they could find their country, individual countries uh, designate the ISSNs. And so when it said, enter your, your ISSN, it also provided a whole route of how to find that and what it was. And that kind of structure, that idea that not everyone uh, is a member of the club around journal publishing, that inviting aspect has been very important to us. Um, we have a PKP school um, that we provide uh, support for, and not just for how to use OJS. One of the features of PKP School is how to be an editor generally, how to be a peer reviewer. So again, this idea that being open is necessary, but it's not sufficient. There needs to be that support um, and that structure. The PKP Documentation Hub, um, for me, is a model of this He went on mute there, John. Excuse me, okay, sorry. Did that make a difference to anyone's comprehension on what I was saying? A little bit, okay. That's a good sign, we're just testing. Um, but I was talking about the Documentation Center as being a, uh, a good example of how we provide support at every level. Um, and the PKP Community Forums, the last one in this series I would introduce, um, which is where we listen and are open to the community. One of our strengths and one of the You did it again, John. You gotta watch sorry, that. You can't, you can't keep clicking it, I know. I'm sorry, I get carried <laughs> away here. Okay, hands off my mouse, okay? That was the problem. All right, here we go. Uh, PKP Community Forum, I was describing um, before I inadvertently cut my own self off. That's kind of a Freudian. But anyway, let's not get into that. Um, and the point that I'm trying to make is that the openness to the to balancing views in the community. Alec recently had a series of comments about how we would get to that sense of how much information we share with authors. Um, and the community was providing very pointed feedback and we were talking about our interests and being very open and transparent. That kind of debate, that openness to debate is a really important one. In fact, that leads to my final point about being open to opposing views. Um, I have one example that I haven't trotted out for years but probably have worn out in terms of the statute of limitations. And that is a tribute to Roly Lorimer introducing subscriptions to OJS, um, at which point I was a little bit concerned, um, but realized and had pointed out to me uh, by one of the developers that in fact, if it's open, it's open. Uh, and open to different uses, open to different positions around the nature of publishing. Um, and that kind of openness has been a critical aspect um, for the way we operate. So I would say that I would, to the community, I see how it's happening now. I would I'd make an invitation to the community um, to call us on this openness, to continue to use the different forms that we provide, um, to engage in us, engage with us in a dialogue around the openness and the degree and extent to which that happens, um, and to help us in that sense progress 
um, because we're only as open as we are in terms of that larger community. Um, and we remain uh, stalwart. In fact, we've upgraded our license recently, the GPL, um, to three, and uh, we are continuing to be members of that community in a, in a legal and official sense, but we also want to inform that community about the extent of openness. So thank you. And I, I will mute myself now uh, in the proper way. <laughs> thank you very much, John. Um, Marissa's worked very hard on the PKP membership program. Um, so over to Marissa. Thank you. Um, so just wanted to introduce uh, and do a sneak peek to um, a PKP membership program that we're developing. And earlier this year, uh, we proposed a new membership program to our team and to our advisory committee. And so under this model, um, what it's going to be is it's uh, expanding on our existing contributor and sustainer opportunities. So it's going to be a kind of a hybrid fund development and volunteer management program. It's going to introduce member benefits for financial and non-financial contributions. And so we're hoping to launch this at the end of the year, probably in about October 2020 in quarter four. So why do we want to launch a membership program and why are we sharing this? Um, Individuals and institutions have been contributing back to PKP for years, so this is nothing new. But what we wanted to do um, was recognize that work, and, and membership programs model is a natural extension of our already successful work. And so it's going to support us in four key areas, sustainability, accountability, transparency, and recognition. So sustainability um, is one of our four sustainability areas, so including publishing services revenue, grants, um, our academic anchor with Simon Fraser University, and the last one, community contributions. So it's part of that sustainability plan. Uh, it's also about accountability. So membership helps to facilitate uh, further adherence to our values, so quality, openness, participation, inclusiveness. Um, it's going to open spots on our committees to non-financial members. It's going to revitalize our members' committee create supported opportunities for community contributions, um, and holding ourselves accountable, that's really part of membership. Um, and also about community accountability. So, you know, what, what would happen to open infrastructure and, and who will support and protect it against corporate acquisition if we're not supporting each other? So it's really about accountability, um, transparency, it's about, um, you know, we can't be community engaged or led or driven or informed or owned, any of those things without involvement from communities. So we wanted a way to make it transparent how community contributions drive our work. Um, and this membership program is gonna enable us to clarify, to recognize and share all of the amazing work um, in a better way. Not that we haven't been doing it, but in a different way. Um, so all the work that we receive from our community. And the last one is recognition. And this is a big one for the new model is a formal membership program is gonna enable us to track and better understand how and who members are um, how they're contributing and do some formal recognition and distinguish between those that sustain the project and, and those that are software users. So making that distinction. So how is it going to work? So membership is going to be, and again, this is an extension of what we currently do. So it's going to be done um, either through financial contribution, which we call sustainers, or by making a volunteer or an in-kind contribution. So you'd be a contributor. And so again, these are familiar words and, and um, ways that people are already contributing and organizations are contributing. You're not going to need to sign up or register to become a member, and membership is granted upon making a sustained contribution. Uh, it's going to be effective for 12 months as of the date of contribution and is renewable upon subsequent contribution or unless specified within a contractual agreement. So really, again, enhancing what we already do. Uh, so there's going to be, again, there's two types, sustainers, there's three types of sustainers. So there's financial contribute, um, contributors. We've got development partners. And again, these are all existing ways that people contribute, our organizations contribute. Development partners are significant financial contribution with matching in kind. It's a three-year agreement. We have campaign uh, contributions right now. That would be our SCOS um, program, which you can read about in the annual report and on the website. So financial contributions dedicated to a specific project or activity. And then we have annual sustainment. So those are our platinum, gold, silver, bronze supporter. So many of you on the call may already, you know, fit into this membership program in one of these areas. Um, and each sustainer level will come with a different set of member benefits. 
contributors. A lot of you on the call are already contributors. So again, enhancing our existing way of doing things. So this is nothing new, um, non-financial contributions, um, definitely not new to PKP. And under this program, we'll continue to work with individuals within each of these areas, but with an added benefit of offering greater recognition for the work that has and will be done. So some of these um, ways that are contributions right now, translation, documentation, accessibility interest group, our education, uh, with PKP community forum, user testing, uh, development or core contributions, code contributions. So in the slides, which we'll share out, um, but you'll also be able to take a peek at some of the member benefits that we'll be offering. Uh, some of them might include things um, that you, it will be on request. So maybe a participation certificate might be important to individuals and we can provide that on request. But there's going to be other things like opportunity to participate in PKP committees, inclusion. Um, this one's new and definitely a sneak peek, so stay tuned, but a PKP service provider directory. So we're going to talk about more of that in the future and uh, invite um, a community to join that. Uh, publishing services, the consultations for financial contributors, uh, member-only events, uh, community consultations. So we want to listen more to our members. Uh, member-only swag. Uh, I know everybody loves stickers, uh, so that's there's some swag, uh, some promotional material is another way to call it. Um, maybe and also looking at assisting your mobile badge for a website um, on request. So you can take a look at the slides. Um, that's a sneak peek at some of the member benefits that we want to be offering. And the next steps are going to be uh, over the next few months and until we launch this later in the year. We're going to be updating and revising our terms of reference for all our committees. So we really, again, want to look at the inclusivity and the diversity of those committees. We want to um, we need to still finalize uh, our membership procedures, how that's all going to work, how we're going to track that. We're going to connect with our existing contributors and sustainers. So a lot of you on the call here, and we'll, we'll invite you to join. Um, you will already be a member, but we'll invite you to some of the member benefits. And then having an online launch um, later in the year as well. So. Um, welcome to comments, suggestions, and concerns. Uh, we'll, we'll put this up on the community uh, forum as well for comments, um, but just, just a quick sneak peek um, to give you a heads up about what's coming soon with recognizing all the great work our community has done. So thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Um, and then thank you again for all the work you put into the to this uh, program as well. Uh, next up, I'm going to turn it over to Alec and to Nate. And I think, Alec, you're, you're up first. Sure. And uh, so I'm on slide number 19, if you're following along at home. Um, I'll take a few minutes just to talk about what we've done over the last uh, year. And then I'll pass it over to Nate after that to talk a bit about what our kind of uh, next directions are going to be and give you a bit of a preview of what's uh, coming over the next year. Um, this is always a great opportunity for us to actually look over what the last year was like because often we're so uh, busy with a thousand uh, different projects we're trying to move forward all at once. So it's always uh, interesting and a bit of a challenge to summarize that down into the most uh, kind of important and cogent things that we worked on. And I think you'll see that there's a tremendous diversity among them. Um, there's plenty of things I didn't have time to mention here, but um, just to give you a bit of a look over uh, what the last year looked like. Um, I've divided this up roughly into quarters, and um, I think I'll just review those quickly and then uh, try to give some context over how that fits into our, our greater uh, development strategy. And of course, I'm talking here about OGS, OMP, and OPS primarily, but those are just the kind of the most visible manifestations of the work that PKP does. So speaking as the person who's running the dev team working on those projects, uh, this is my perspective on that. Um, so in the last half of 2019, uh, we were very heavily um, working on OJS primarily, but also OMP and OPS, uh, 3.2.0. And the main feature that uh, we worked on uh, in those releases is one that actually dates back to, I think as far as 2016, um, to a contribution made by the Free University of Berlin that we've been calling uh, metadata versioning for the last several years. And it's uh, basically a, a feature that allows, I'll, I'll show a few slides in a, a minute here about uh, how it looks to a, a practical user. But from a dev perspective, it required us to really rethink and restructure the way that we talked about um, submission metadata. And uh, uh, it became quite a large dev task that basically occupied us more and more from 2018 through 2019. And we've only just uh, come over that now. And that, that feature was released with OGS and OMP and OPS 3.2.0. 
in the uh, very early parts of 2020 this year. Um, so we're very happy to say that that's, uh, that very deep, we call them a dev trench, um, is now over. And we've dug ourselves out of it, and we're now moving forward with uh, releases since then. Um, in 2019, we also had a couple of events. We had a Pittsburgh Dev Sprint and also, of course, our, our Barcelona Conference. And those are both hosted by uh, some of our partners, um, the University of Pittsburgh and also uh, the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And uh, that just shows the strength of partnerships and the kinds of uh, contributions that uh, our community can can make to uh, bringing our um, relatively small team size uh, to kind of global stature. And so thank you to those groups for, for their work on those events. Um, I know a number of you were there and it was great to, to see you. Of course, we all work uh, virtually and remotely and it's a, a rare treat to be able to spend some time with, uh, with our community and see what they're doing with the software we provide. Um, we, as I say, released, we, we released OGS and OMP 3.2.0 in the first quarter of this year and uh, had a number of different uh, uh, sort of implications with that as well. Um, I also mentioned OPS, Open Preprint Systems. That's our first addition to our software uh, suite for some years, I forget when OMP was first released, but uh, certainly a number of years ago. Um, and I've got a slide on that later on. Um, but just to say, we, we initially released a beta of that in the first quarter. And then the second quarter, we removed the beta designation and formally released that as a full-fledged member of our software suite. And as we've been, we've been doing for many years, several years now, uh, we're attempting to release all of our software simultaneously. So whenever an OGS release comes out, uh, a parallel release of OMP and now OPS come out at the same time. And that's our, our attempt to, um, to unify our software so that maybe in the future we'll be able to release those as uh, kind of different configurations of the same software package. It means that uh, even though we, we uh, might spend more time on one application and less time on the other application, because so much of that work between them is shared, we're able to then release them uh, in parallel and have improvements to, let's say, OJS, also improve OMP. So we're hoping that that's been an impact that uh, folks who use our software have been able to perceive if they've used maybe two applications. Um, I also have a note here about the PKP Preservation Network, um, and I have a couple of slides about that a bit later. Um, I'm happy to say that I've got some good news on that. That's been a, a number of years uh, uh, sort of holding fire, waiting for us to uh, complete some testing and, and make sure that things are ready to go. Um, I think I will leave it from there and move on to uh, the next slide, number 21, which is the PKP Preservation Network. Um, we released a bit of a mea culpa uh, early this year, a blog post saying, uh, explaining why it is that the PKP Preservation Network for OGS 3.x was taking so long to get to launch. And essentially, um, it's a, a combination of a lot of priorities the dev team work on. We're, we're not a huge group, and we always have a lot of projects that we'd like to move forward, but we have to allocate our resources amongst those projects. And this one proved to be a bit of a challenge because um, it combines uh, a couple of different um, approaches to, to delivering software. One is the one that we know and we do uh, fairly regularly, which is to release open source software that people then take and install on their own systems. The other one is to run a service um, on the PKP web servers. And this is the, uh, the LOX service, of course, and the additional pieces of that, lox matic and the, the staging server that comprise the, the service portion of the PKP preservation network. And that's something that we're still figuring out uh, how to do reliably and for the long term. Um, and then, of course, the, the integration between those two elements requires expertise on both sides and, uh, and a lot of testing, because now we're talking about running perhaps three, four, or five different versions of OGS, all to deposit within the same version of this uh, service that we're also running. Long story short, um, that took a lot longer than we thought it would. And uh, we posted that, that explanation on March 30th. I'm very happy to say that uh, I snuck the PKP Preservation Network plugins for OGS 3.x into the plugin gallery for OGS uh, early this week. So those are now available for installation. We've seen our first deposits from, um, from the PKP Preservation Network for OGS 3.x now being ingested into locks, and so it's essentially operational. So please watch for a formal announcement of that launch um, to appear on the PKP website uh, in the coming days. But uh, if you want to get started, go ahead and install the plugin and follow through the instructions there. Um, feedback is welcome on our forum, of course. And I'd like to thank uh, our partners and the various community testers who were very patient with us um, over the last, I would say, year of trying to debug those last pesky and very difficult problems to resolve. So. Fingers crossed, and uh, do watch for that launch announcement to come up very shortly. Um, another thing we've been working on quite a bit for the last years um, is uh, a translation tool set that uh, works better for our community and um, just better fosters a community of collaborative translation. 
And this is a subject we've had at our sprints for the last uh, several years. And I'm happy to say that that launched uh, early this year. Um, a, a last bit of very intensive work um, was undertaken at the Barcelona conference. And again, I'd like to thank our, our, our friends there at the Autonomous University of Barcelona for their, um, their work on translation, their support, their uh, software tool sets, all that kind of thing that really finally got us over this push into launching a service for translators uh, using the very successful and very high quality Weblate uh, tool set, which is free and open source software for um, translations for, for software. This is what it looks like for translators on slide 23. Essentially, it's what you might imagine. It's a forum where you can see text that needs translations. You can uh, review translations that are missing. You can check and correct translations that are flagged for review, um, all that sort of thing. It's a professional grade translation tool set. And for us, if you go over to slide 24, it essentially means we've been able to bump our number of translations um, in OJS over just a small number of months since we launched it from, 33, uh, from 28 to 33. And more importantly, the number of complete translations from nine to 20 for the most recent release. Um, that is really unprecedented for us. We've always had a very um, diligent and uh, very welcome set of translations, uh, translators. And these are all volunteers. Um, who have worked on the software to maintain translations, but their work has been complicated by the lack of a good translation tool set. That's now changed, and what we're seeing is we're seeing uh, a very stark increase in the number of complete translations, in the amount of returning work um, for each release, in our own ease of management, um, making sure that our translations are kept up to date. And uh, more importantly, I think most importantly, it's now collaborative, whereas previously, um, we made some attempts to uh, allow people to translate collaboratively, but most of the translation work came from one group working on translations in their own environment then coming back to us to, uh, to then merge that with the software or not. Often translators would solve their own translation problem and then not come back to us with, uh, with a translation to contribute to the community. So this is uh, really, although it is a software task, this really has revolutionized the, um, the translations available within our software. And we're seeing new languages coming up like uh, Hebrew, Kurdish, Macedonian, Catalan, um, and lots more. So uh, if you're interested in translations or have done work on that before and haven't seen this tool set, consider checking it out. And if you're using OGS in a non-English language, I think you may have already seen the impact of that uh, just in the last months um, since the launch of that WebLake tool set. And again, uh, this is a third-party tool set, and I can't say enough uh, good about um, their software. Um, and on page 25, you can see in practice what this looks like for us. It's hard to tell, but those green stripes are uh, graphs indicating um, how far the translations are to completion. And it's an undifferentiated essentially 100%. So we've really seen an improvement there. Moving on to slide 26, uh, I did mention this versioning feature, which kept us quite occupied between as early as 2016 and, and uh, the release of OGS 3.2.0. Um, if you've been working with OGS 3.2.0, you've seen there's quite a different model around how publishing works. Um, if you've had to do an upgrade from a previous version of OGS, you might have noticed that there were some hiccups. We're doing a lot of work to improve the uh, upgrade tool set. Um, already with the release of 3.2.1, that's much improved, and we've had a, a revolutionary change in how we're doing upgrades starting with 3.3. So we've heard some feedback on that. We've worked with a number of you on the forums on doing upgrades, and I'm happy to say that there's some big improvements already in place and some very big improvements coming very shortly. But what this looks like for a reader is uh, previously in OJS and OMP and OPS by extension, when somebody uh, corrected, let's say, a typo in a, an abstract or made a change to a submission, that change simply went live. And starting with 3.2.0, uh, there's now a versioning feature where we track those changes. So you can see on the slide on the lower right-hand corner, there are two versions listed. And as a reader, if you go over to number 27, you can tab between the two essentially and see what changes were made. So now it's a more responsible way to publish uh, a correction to a submission if, if that's an important change. If you've uh, corrected an errata or something worthy of tracking and indicating to a user that if they, for example, cited an article, they may have cited an earlier version. And there is an indicator on the old version to say there's a new version published and uh, you can click here to get it. On the back end of things, uh, if you look on slide 28, uh, just to give you a brief glance, essentially it means that you can navigate between versions and all of the metadata, any of your galleys, your PDF documents or whatever, uh, those are all now versions. So you can now um, view the iterations of a submission uh, once you get into that stage of the workflow and see how it's changed, how it's evolved, what corrections were made, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a very logical change for OGS users, but uh, quite a revolutionary one for the way that we conceive of a submission in the software and uh, the capabilities now for us to 
uh, uh, provide that data downstream to any other services that support a uh, consideration of revisioning and versioning for a published article. I'll move over to 29, and I really haven't given much time to OPS, but OPS is, as I say, our first new addition to the software suite uh, in a number of years. And uh, you can think of it as essentially OGS for preprints. And preprints are clearly getting a lot of uh, uh, press coverage recently, um, particularly with, with COVID. And I have to give a huge shout out to uh, Cielo, uh, who I know is here as well, um, who helped us with this project immeasurably, including funding, but also with testing, with feedback, with design, all those sorts of things. And also to NTUC Nygaard, who's a developer um, who essentially took this on uh, with some help from the dev team, of course, and some coordination over the shared aspects of this project, who really made OPS happen. And uh, I won't give too much time to this, but I will say that uh, the Cielo launch uh, really pushed our timelines forward. They've been very good about helping us to iterate on the software to improve it. Um, that is now uh, finalized release, no longer in beta. Um, free software, much like OJS, that you can use to quickly launch uh, a preprint um, press, as it were, um, along the same lines as OJS. And if you're familiar with OJS, uh, it operates the same way. You can think of it as essentially a, a subset of OJS features with a few um, preprint specific uh, pieces added on. Um, I'll pass it over now to Nate, who's going to talk about the roadmap. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Great. Okay, um, I'm going to start from slide 30 if you're following along. Uh, I'm just going to gloss over a couple of these so we have some time for questions. Um, there is a link on these slides, uh, so I do encourage you to click on that and, and have a look. This is a public roadmap document that we've, that we've created, um, so you can have a look at that. Um, the roadmap is really our attempt to try and synthesize and put together a list of kind of all the major development priorities that come from uh, all the different sources that we receive feedback from. So that's places like the community forum, or GitHub issues, uh, it's from our strategic partners or our own publishing services uh, people, um, as well as things like the focus groups that we run at sprints and some of the UX testing that we do. Um, the document is kind of just an attempt for us to really wrap our heads around the, the scale of the, the set of requests that we have, make sure that we're not dropping key, key priorities, um, and then helping us to actually schedule uh, whatever we identify as kind of the key things that we need to work on next, uh, making sure that we can schedule that across uh, the next major milestones. So in the, in the document, you're only gonna see the major development priorities, whether or not they're scheduled. In fact, most won't be scheduled. Um, I'll let you kind of explore with that. I'll just kind of draw your attention to, there's a separate milestone spreadsheet which talks about estimated release dates and stuff. And we're kind of trying to move towards a more regular but also more frequent um, release cycle. Uh, I just want to spend the last couple of minutes that I have just talking about a couple of the major things that we've identified as work we're going to tackle in the next few versions. Um, so if you look at slide 32, um, this is work we scheduled around accessibility. Um, so uh, we've got an accessibility interest group that is keeping track of some of this stuff and they'll be reporting out over the next months and years as we, as we work on this. Um, but on the roadmap, you'll see we've basically sort of sliced out bits of the application uh, that we can prepare for an audit and then commission a professional uh, accessibility audit to be undertaken. And then once we get that audit back, work on those issues and roll them out. So, uh, we've kind of got a stage process where we've, we've done our default theme for OJS. We're planning for 3.3, or sorry, 3.4 to prepare the submission process for an audit. Um, and then in 3.5, we'll, we'll deliver fixes for that as well as commission an audit on the review process. And so that's kind of how we'll roll out accessibility. Um, the other one I want to draw your attention to is uh, the next slide, emails and notifications. Um, so this has been a huge priority from our community. There's just a whole bunch of feature requests around sending bulk emails, as well as especially the process of kind of sending emails in the workflow. Um, so we have a whole bunch of work scheduled around that. Uh, everything from being able to add CC and BCC recipients to being able to more easily find and customize some of the email templates and things like that. So. Um, there's quite a bit of work scheduled there. Again, I'll just ask you to sort of have a look through that roadmap if you have a chance, because um, there's quite a bit there. Um, on the theme of kind of what uh, John was saying earlier, uh, you know, the roadmap, I just will say briefly, is kind of our, um, our first major attempt to 
uh, uh, that the first major part of a kind of a process that we're beginning now to do a better job of both communicating out our priorities um, so that so that the community knows better what we're planning to work on why we think it's important um, but that is, is also just kind of the first step of uh, a process where we also want to get better about explaining how we come to these priorities what are the sources of input that we receive how are we making decisions about this stuff uh, and also to get the community more involved in that process so again i'll just ask you if you have a moment take a look at the roadmap. If you see things that we're missing or you think um, there are some changes that should be made or whatever, please for now go ahead and post in the community forum um, and keep an eye out for more regular or um, uh, uh, more formal sort of ways that we're planning to, to gather some feedback and stuff that, that might be coming in the next few months or we might incorporate in some of the membership stuff that's been talked about before. Um, but I'll leave it at that and I'll hand back over to you, Alan. Thanks so much, Nate, um, and uh, thanks so much, Alec. Uh, you've made some development partners very happy with the news about the Preservation Network uh, uh, news. That's great. Um, so I think if you have questions, you can contact uh, PKP through the website, through the forum, through Twitter, or Facebook.